And then if we could do, perfect, thank you. If we could do quick introductions, I, so often we have such little time that we jump into these meetings and there's all of these faces that I've never met and I feel rude. So can we do a, like a quick round robin? Do you want to call people out or? Sure. On people? I will call out and in, both are appropriate depending on the situation. Let's go with Tina because she's right in that order. Oh, well, you guys, you know everybody, right? Do you know everybody? Yeah, I know everybody. But Tina, Regional Commission's Director, hello everyone. Um, Rebecca. Hey folks, I think I have had the pleasure of meeting with the new staff on the call, but I am Rebecca. I am Program and Planning Chair this year. I'm from Newton. I'm very rarely in this office, but probably will be more and more in, um, in the Peru, actually. So I'm having a nice view out here. Yeah. Wow. My That's farm nice. on the 25th floor of the Peru, so. You've been opting to work at home when you had the option to work in the Peru with that view? Well, I like to have a zero minute commute. And I've had yeah. I've had very iffy childcare, especially in August, but now we're back to school. So I'll likely be here a couple very days. Cool. Anyway, great so, to be here with y'all. Very cool. Am I, maybe I'm the only one that doesn't know everybody. So rather than like, my name's Sarah and nice to meet everybody else. Um, Ellen? Hi, Sarah. Communications, right? I, I, I have I have email, but I don't have a face. So yes. it's wonderful. I am the new communications and marketing director here at MCSW. Glad to be with you. I did email you about a press release. Let me know. Um, great good. to be with you all. Just write that down. Um, and I want to make, go ahead. Yep. Shalea West, um, great to meet you all. I'm the new program and research director. Um, what is it, week four at this point? So I'm really happy to be here. Um, and working very closely with Ellen, Shaitia, and everyone else on all these initiatives. So I'm excited to, to meet you all. Wonderful. Four weeks. It feels like four minutes. I feel like I just got that email from you. Holy cow. Okay. Um, so let's let's go ahead and get started then because I know we we have a fairly full agenda. Um, do we have an uh, do we have enough to vote for minutes? All right, so let's let's open with that. Can I get a motion to approve the August 9th minutes? Can I move to approve all three at the same time, Sarah, if that's okay? That's allowed. I am a huge fan of efficiency. So um, I, great. Can I get great, a second yeah. to approve all three? Okay. Beautiful. Hi, Jean. Hi. Hey, sorry. No, 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 chair. no worries. We, we're just getting started. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, if you don't mind, while we wait for Nina, because I don't want to steal her thunder on the treasurer's report, um, I'm going to jump around a little bit for, and I, I'm really excited to have the conversation about as a follow-up to the diversity and equity and inclusion conversation that we had the last executive meeting. But I met, Shaiti and I both, and Aisha, met with Tanisha and Gamal yesterday to brainstorm some ideas and talk that through and they both said that they could join today. Um, so they, I believe they'll be on about 4.30. So I'm gonna take that and pause until they get here. Um, so I'll jump right to Marcom and then anybody else, please feel, feel free to jump in there. I did <clears throat> have a phone call with Allison, um, just, just to make sure that everybody was on the same page that the, our Marcom committee was an ad hoc in, um, in the absence of having staff to actually do that work. So it was a heavy lift. There was a lot of work done by a lot of people doing that. Allison was, was front and center in a lot of that. And so I just wanted to have a courtesy call to make sure that she knew that, that was an ad hoc. It's no longer um, in existence because we don't need it because we have Ellen here and we have um, the, the work laid out for us now. So that will go away in lieu of working with Ellen. And then as Ellen needs folks and Allison said she'd be happy to still be available, then you'll reach out as needed. Um, and Allison and I have connected already. She's wonderful. It's been great. Perfect. Okay. Um, can we spend just one second, since we're switching to have a more formal, a staff-based um, approach, which, which is how it should be, what things actually need approval? So for example, like the, the newsletter every time doesn't need seven sets of eyes, all those things, but so press releases, is there anything else that you need regular input on before that, that could potentially be a bottleneck? Because I want to make sure I am not that. 
I love this uh, line of questioning, and I think maybe worth coming up with a list of assets and then deciders. So, of course, you know, I regularly bounce the newsletter off Shaitia, but then if the two of us are in agreement, does that then need to go to commissioners or is that an internal marketing piece? Whereas I would say more press and PR press releases, I think should always go by um, at least one commissioner, I, whoever is designated. So something that Ellen and I were discussing, but we hadn't gotten very far on, um, is that we have a draft of a commissioner handbook and Shaitia beautifully actually found the link to that. I think I spent all year last year trying to find Jerry's the link to that and never did. Um, so I think program and planning is going to discuss next week in our meeting how to take that handbook forward. But I do know that there's a draft policy on statements made by the commission and who needs to review what. So I do not believe that there is a binding policy currently, but that that was in the works. And to the extent people have feelings about it, they should communicate that to Ellen or to me so that we can get that back in our program and planning work as we figure out how we're going to memorialize this in the handbook. Beautiful. Um, <clears throat> I think that's that's great. I worked a little bit on that commissioner's handbook. So I, I remember right? that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, like, did. I think we I had a break remember. from it for a whole year and now we're gonna really? get back up. Um, okay, well, that's exciting. Um, and I think that actually has an opportunity to go into the equity inclusion work. So I think that's also exciting. Another way to have, have that um, show up and be, be memorialized. Um, so in the meantime, I will I will speak my my preference and then please feel free to, to amend. If it's going a, a newsletter, if you need somebody to spell check and grammar check your, your newsletter, that's the monthly work that reflected what the staff are doing beyond our executive director, I think we have a different problem. So I would say that we, we hired an executive director that then picked her own staff um, I think we just support that. And if there's feedback, then we give it. And then then that feedback can be implemented the next week, month. If anybody is anybody in disagreement with that approach? No. And I also think that we can draw a line between statements that come out on behalf of the staff, for example, Shaitia as the author of the newsletter versus statements that come off under the signature of the chair of the commission. For example, if we're making a statement about an event, you know, like, row being overturned or whatever like and that's coming out from the chair and the vice chair or whatever it is that to me is different that should maybe pass through the people's eyes who are the signatories so i i would agree with that 100 i i personally don't um I, nothing should go out under under my name without me seeing it directly if it's going out under the commission in a statement um i would always can be available to make to to give feedback, but I I would generally concede that I'll just tell you my style. I would generally concede that to who um, works most closely with that audience. So, for example, we we had pondered doing a statement about the Capes removal of um, a what was a um, a specific nurse that does rape kits and um, an interview. So that wasn't that was an impacted women on the Cape, and it was it was presented through the region. So I kicked that over to Meredith and said. I would be more comfortable if Meredith would were comfortable with what the statement is, and I'm happy to support her. So I, I think we could do it that way. And in the absence of that, then either me or Aisha could could serve as proxy for that. Aisha, are you comfortable with that? I'm sorry, I um, I didn't really, I wasn't here. <laughs> no, that's I just okay. Came back to the conversation, so I didn't hear what you said. Sorry. No, no, no that, that's fine. So the. In summary, what we're talking about is when things go out from Ellen and Shaitia or any of the other staff that's going out on behalf of the commission, if it's the newsletter and those kinds of things, those are clearly staff um, initiatives. If it's something that's speaking, that's making a statement on behalf of the commission to the public in some way that it needs another set of eyes. Um, if it's going out under the authorship of someone else, then that person should obviously look at it. If it's going out on behalf of the whole commission, then it should be either you or I and or whoever is most close to that audience. So I gave the example of Meredith being um, responsible for regionals, that she would be the one that would look over something that was going out on behalf of a single region. She would have a much more informed view on that than I would. Does that make I sense? Agree. Yep. Okay. Um, and in, I mean- I, I'm of, not on chair. I'm glad that Commissioner Back is on, because certainly she's been around um, 
not as long as I have, but I would just caution what you're saying. Uh, we've seen time and time again, the staff is almost completely new. We've seen time and time again where things have gone out, for example, with you, Dr. Miller, where your name wasn't properly um, checked, people's addresses wasn't checked. I've heard that you've disbanded, and I get it, the MARCOM committee. But anything that's going out, including the newsletter, really is going out under the brand of the commissioners. So there definitely needs to be some sort of better check um, check and balance of the work. So if there's not a committee to do that, are you saying that you and Aisha are going to be responsible for all of that? But there almost should be a protocol for approval for posting and it's basic, but you know, if you're putting something out on a commissioner, you need to check with that commissioner, um, what you're saying, but anything going out under MCSW is is all of the commissioners, is the brand. And I have seen things even now, I forget the last newsletter, I think you guys know, I've had some concerns about how things are being put out. So I know we talked quickly this morning, Sarah, about you disbanded uh, Marcom, but there needs to be a, something. And again, you have to remember, the staff is fairly new. I'm not even sure if people have read the bylaws cover to cover. I think, uh, Commissioner Back, there is something in the bylaws about communication. So I, I just wanted to jump in here and say that from a historical perspective, even in terms of who speaks for the commission, et cetera. No, thank you, Danella. And I think it, what you're saying is really helpful. And I think you joined just after we introduced this topic and what we're talking about now is because Marcom is no longer, how are we gonna ensure that things are properly vetted without that in place? And we were discussing finalizing the policy that we had drafted as part of the commissioner handbook, but was never finalized. And this is exactly what you're talking about, what the protocol is for what's approved and what we were just discussing as you were jumping in is that something going out under Shaitia's signature can be handled within the staff, something going out under the banner of MCSW or particular commissioners will be vetted by the appropriate commissioners, whether it's somebody who substantively has to do with that or the person who's signing it, like if it's Sarah and Aisha signing it as chair and vice chair. So I think we're all in agreement. We just sort of have to get the ball rolling in this manner and i was mentioning that program and planning will be revisiting working on the handbook starting at our meeting next week so we'll definitely be taking this up making sure everybody's on the same page and making sure things are going out properly thank, thank you, you commissioner you. back one clarification mm -hmm. shaitia represents this commission so she's sending out an email I'm, I'm just saying we need to be specific on the protocol we don't know who the next executive director will be if the executive director is sending out an email of her personal updates yeah that's great but if she's sending out something for example to our appointing authorities somebody needs to say see what she's sending because she's not sending it out on her behalf in her role, she's sending it out on behalf of the commission. So I still think there needs to be within the protocols clarity in terms of what is being sent out from the staff and the executive director. It's still on under our behalf. For example, right, Aisha, I wouldn't write a recommendation for related bill without on behalf of my board without making sure my board was in alignment that I was writing that just because I'm the CEO I can't just put anything. So I agree well, I, with I you agree with Rebecca that. I just think you have to give some guardrails um, in terms of what the staff is allowed to put out because functionally they're still representing the commission. Heard, heard, and we will work with that as we nail down the policy. And of course, that policy will need to be approved by the commission. And I, I will just just jump in here in here quickly. Is I, I agree with everything that ever that everyone said. I think I think what um, what you caught at the end was in while we're developing and, and finalizing that policy, so we haven't memorialized and we have all those guardrails spelled out. At minimum, make sure that we've got double sets of eyes and it's going to go out publicly until we get that sort of rubric of who goes goes where. So it's a short term. We're all agreeing that we need we need it vetted if it's going publicly, and then with the the ultimate goal to have a um, a policy that then outlives all of us. 
Um, T, I think I said Tina and then Ellen. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I just have a question for clarification for the regionals because it sounded like uh, Meredith was to approve regional communication. Maybe I misunderstood. And if yeah. so, that might be an issue with I some of our regionals. I do not think so, Sarah, just just to update as well, that's something that program and planning is also going to be discussing is program and planning has a large umbrella of functions. And now that we have a greater staff with different divisions, one of the things on our agenda for next week is what still needs to be an ad hoc committee? What what are we focusing on as as commissioners and what are we handing off to staff? and making sure that that's crystal clear. And one of the things that I think is that, as I understand it, the regional ad hoc was intended to be in place until just like Marcom until we got staff and now we have Tina. So if you want, you know, Meredith has a wealth of institutional knowledge about the regionals, but I think that um, me and Jean and whoever becomes our program and planning secretary to the extent that you need commissioner eyes, it might just go straight to program and planning rather than going to Meredith, who I think had a role with regionals. But now that we have Tina, it's Tina on the staff side and the program and planning leadership on the commissioner side. So that that is really helpful because I didn't understand that that committee was also ad hoc. Um, so th thank you for that clarification. And Tina, to answer your question, I wasn't saying everything that goes to regionals goes to Meredith. A very specific example is something came to me um, about that a region brought to us. And I said, Meredith would have, a, and I think Meredith's copy, she would have a better sense of the appropriateness of our response to that. So I wanted her feedback. So it was one example in how that, that came into question, not a blanket statement in, in, in general. Okay, thank you for that clarification, because I, I just think I, I don't want regionals to feel like they've been appointed and then don't have any authority to put out a statement. So, okay, thank you for the clarification. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Ellen, I just maybe wanted to say, um, and appreciate Commissioner Clark for raising that and appreciate also Shaitia because in this first sort of 60 days, our focus is on building that infrastructure. So maybe to sort of uh, say, rest assured, I hear and appreciate those concerns and getting everything right down to copy editing, how folks want their names reflected is of course a, a learning curve, but a standard of excellence that we're absolutely committed to. Like those kinds of, uh, of spelling errors are you know, absolutely mitigated by a, a checklist, at least two eyes. Um, so whatever this policy ends up taking in form, know that we do take it seriously. Um, and if there's ever something that, you know, you don't like the way something's reflected, you wanna see something new, Please come to me. You know, we welcome your thoughts. Your oh, feedback. we will. Don't, don't yeah, worry. I love it. I love we it. Will. Well. Bring it to the newsletter. Um, but, I, and I, I appreciate that you, I love that you said that standard of excellence because that's what we all, that's what we need to strive for. And if we're representing all the women in the Commonwealth, that then no bar is too high. Um, and, and like, I think your first newsletter, both Aisha and I went line, or maybe the second one, went line by line. And as you continue to perfect that and get that feedback and incorporate that, it will be less and less and less. So even if it needs four sets of eyes, it would be, it would be a much shorter process as we build in, in that infrastructure. Um, Shaitia. Hi, I just, two things. Um, the first thing is I want to be really clear um, as we are um, working on that, that policy that we're talking about, what is the uh, request of you as chair, this committee for us regarding the newsletter? Because I know that is something that does go out representing the commission. There is a section that I write, but I just want to make sure, like, is the protocol for now until we get the protocol written? Ellen and I to work on it and show a proof before it gets released to you, to Aisha, to, you know, I just, I need it clear, <laughs> explicit. And then the other thing yeah. is um, the, no, I'll just, I'll leave it that. I'll leave that. Um, before I answer, Commissioner Clark, what would you recommend? Like I have so, a thought, but I want to see. What I, you, look, what I, you I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be in the um, minority here, and I'm happy to be in the minority. And I understand, and I talked to Chairwoman uh, Glenn Smith this morning, so I understand why you made the decision that you made. But I, I also just think for engagement of commissioners. Mm -hmm. Etc. I, I for one don't think now you, you didn't have the best leader. 
but I don't think it's a bad idea to have people that have marketing expertise. I know just because she's my sister friend, Aisha is pretty busy. I mean, she's on this call now and she's like in between the call. You're pretty busy. I, I really think there should be a group of people. Now, Rebecca, you may say it should be within program and planning. I just think given what I've seen, given how people's moving, given the fact that Ellen is brand new, and again, I'm not even sure if people have fully studied the bylaws or researched us or understand who we are. I think there really should be a dedicated group of people. If you don't want to call it an ad hoc committee, this is a great way to engage people. You have some new commissioners. Can't remember the woman's name right now, Shaitia, who she came to our retreat. If there are people that have expertise in marketing, in writing, in communications, it's not a bad idea, even if you rotated them off, to have three of so people, even not for nothing, Tina, there may be some regional um, chairs that would have interest in this that Ellen and Shaitia can work with. I think this thing of saying you and Aisha are going to look at everything is, could potentially hold things up on the one hand. And then on the other hand, I think having some sort of marketing communications committee is a great opportunity to engage um, commissioners in some of the work and not have all of the work be on two people. So I, and, and I just think when you're putting something out underneath the brand of the organization, it, it needs some clear, some checks and balances, but that's, I, that's just me. I, I understand why you felt the need to disband it, but I think it's needed in some form or it needs to sit somewhere. I don't think it could be dependent just on uh, staff, particularly a staff that's new to the commission. It may not be new to the work, but I think Ellen would agree every organization is different. I don't know what you have in your organization, Sarah, but in my organization, I actually have a marketing committee and maybe even putting together a committee that could help with press releases and some of the outreach because they have relationships um, with key industries, et cetera. And there may be people around that has that. I know Liz Friedman called me the other day because she knows I have connection with the press. Is this an opportunity to re-engage Liz? So just something you maybe not to answer today, Sarah, mm -hmm. but I, I think you should think about some, some group or that this should live somewhere beyond the staff. Thank you. I mean, I, what I can't answer today is I, it can't, it definitely can't be me always and see everything because I would bottleneck in a way that would, that was, would be unfair to the staff. So I take that point hundred percent. So it's, it's, if not that, what, um, and Rebecca, do you have a, a thought on that? Yeah, thank you. So my thought right now is as we work on the policy, um, Shaitia needs an answer for her day-to-day -day work um, with the newsletter and with the staff. And what I would recommend is sending out an email to the full commission. Um, I wouldn't necessarily involve the regional commissioners at this point, because we don't know if they have the institutional knowledge to know our commissioners and our work, but to suggest, you know, if you want to volunteer to help review uh, outward facing materials and marketing materials while the staff, you know, gets their sea legs, um, you know, please let us know. And then you can just email that list of people. Here's the thing, you know, first come, first serve, please take a look. And then you don't have to burden one individual or certainly our chair and vice chair, who I understand mm -hmm. and, you know, believe 100% are super, super busy people. So that would be my suggestion because I, I do agree with Danella. It's a good opportunity to allow for engagement um, and then just like an extra safeguard uh, to have some review while everybody um, gets really comfortable in their new positions. Um, so I think it's a good discussion and we can keep having it as we work on the handbook. Thank you. Um, so I do, I'd put one, just one, um, one edit to that, if you wouldn't mind, would be to also whatever that group is that responds to two things, to in, copy the executive committee on that. Um, because if if I had 20 minutes and it happened to be that day, I'd love to give you feedback if, if, if it was there, um, but I don't want you to, I don't want to make you stuck. 
so that so that there's always the opportunity. And then the second, when you when you do have that group, that I would word the question every time as um, you know, please give feedback by Thursday and silence is consensus. I made up Thursday, but give them a reasonable amount of time to look at it so that you're not um, you know, backed up for, for whatever reason. If we have a dedicated group, we shouldn't be, but just in case, that's kind of belt and suspenders so that you guys have a path forward. Um, Ellen. And just to say at next week's full regional, um, excuse me, uh, full convening, I Shakti has given me about 20 minutes of the agenda to talk through the beginning of a comms plan. So not only guardrails on policy, but also guardrails on language. Um, how do I interact with folks online? Do we acknowledge hecklers? Uh, so there's sort of like a deeper comms conversation I want to have that incorporates into the strategy as well. So I can certainly bring this to my, my small time during next week's full meeting as well. Great. Um, thank you. That's actually a good segue into a question that I have about the full commission meeting is that generally these, at least the way that Chairwoman Clark ran them, um, is a way that I really appreciated, which which is the executive committee meeting is scheduled before the full commission meeting for just that reason to be able to vet and talk through the agenda. So that so for example, if you're presenting a 20, 20 minutes on a um, on a comms plan, it would be great if the executive committee saw it first. Right, so that it gives you the, the feedback so that you're prepared when you get up there and so there aren't any surprises. Um, so I think we can talk about how we, how and when, it, perhaps in that communications document, how and when we expect to see an agenda, um, how we get feedback so that it, you can, it can be posted again timely without being a bottleneck, but so that we've got an opportunity to kind of do a dry run. Um, so we'll, I mean, I think we'll, we'll talk through it, but this is, I think, I think that's a really good discussion. Um, just in the interest of time, and I do well, want to- Well, Madam Chair, in the interest of time, because y'all know I can't let something go when you say that, I would say, given that, given this discussion, that that's not ready for the full commission meeting. You know what I mean? Look at this discussion, and she's just telling you now she's planning to have a 20-minute discussion on this, and Commissioner Back is saying we're still working on the policies, et cetera. That's not ready for a full commission discussion, is it? I was hoping to have that input to inform our plan. So of course, recognizing that it's not complete yet, but showing almost a draft of what we've got, topics we've been discussing. I'm trying to work on sort of 30, 60, 90 content day chunks, um, you know, making sure we're prepped for the month ahead. So it's sort of a little bit of everything. It would be a touch of policy, a touch of content, almost an introduction to myself, um, and let them know sort of the things that I'm trying to pursue this year, uh, almost to solicit a little bit of their feedback to then turn around a full plan for your review. I, I hear you, and you know, Sarah is my successor, but the chair sets the agenda for the meeting, not the staff. This is her, is her as she says, I'm her advisor, and I wouldn't advise that. This is your first meeting, Sarah, to set the tone. You had a big budget discussion that went a little longer than, than necessary. We got a public hearing coming up. The staff doesn't set the agenda. The chair and the executive committee sets the agenda. I just think this is Sarah's first meeting and this isn't ready for prime time, but certainly again, it is her meeting. And if she wants to do that, there's only a few of us on and we could see where this has gone. And Sarah, just think about the conversation you and I had this morning about the leader that was in that role. I just don't think this is ready. And I don't think this is a good way for you to come out. This is your meeting. I mean, it's a commission's meeting, but you're the chair. I, I wouldn't come out with this. It's not, we're not ready for it at a um, September I, meeting. Yeah, but I, it's I, up to you to take it to take it up. I don't know what's going on if you and Shaitia hadn't met or whatever, but you set the agenda. Um, I, I appreciate that feedback and agree with it. So so you said it much more um, directly and succinctly than, than I did. I think that was exactly what I was getting at. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, I'm not comfortable having a 20 minutes on the agenda of something I haven't seen. So, so, so I think, I think that there's planning and I think that it should come to this committee and um, to make sure that it's all buttoned up because if, um, and I know you may, maybe haven't gone to one of these meetings, but you, when you've got 19 folks and open to the public with a, an open-ended set of questions, you're going to get 19 people and 75 opinions and you're going to spin. And I don't, I, I don't want to see you put in that position or, or use our time that way. So I want to set that up to succeed. So if we could, put a pin in that one because it's a really big topic and it's a long time in, in an hour and a half meeting. 
Um, I want to just make sure that it, that when it goes out, that it goes out with the most opportunity for success and feedback possible. Um, that sounds great. And that said, going forward, I do want to use this meeting so that we have before this meeting, and I realize it's my first and I was out. So I, I know that I'm a little behind the eight ball um, for, our, for our first meeting to do this in particular, but I'd love to be able to spend this meeting approving minutes and then going through in detail what the agenda is for the full commission meeting. Because that's our, you know, that's our, our big public facing opportunity. We only have a few because they're only once a month. Um, so the more ready we are for a full commission meeting, it would be a really good use of this time. Um, I am going to, is Nina coming on to do the treasurer's report? Or she did say she has another meeting at the same time. So she's juggling. Okay. So I'm going to wait to, to present that because again, I don't want to present for her. Um, why don't we do legislative and public policy report? We don't have Meredith. We have Gamal. I can do program and planning if you want. Let's go with that. Okay. So program and planning is having our first meeting next week. I had a really great meeting with Ellen, who's going to be staffing our committee most directly about what we want on our agenda. And we have a big year planned. Um, I've also met with Shalea to talk about how we're going to be um, evolving our um, hearings and reports so that you know the hearings are now going to be localized but the reports are still topical and we're working on a work plan to figure out how we're going to collect our data and put out probably two reports a year on topics in addition to collecting the testimony in general from women in the different localities or people who care about issues facing women and girls i should say um, so I think we're going to have a couple of great discussions in program and planning about our year ahead, our big calendar. We have, you know, many things going on, including our hearings, our regular events, our 25th anniversary, Jelly, all of the work that program and planning does. We're also going to be talking about uh, commissioner staff division of labor now that we have um, an updated structure and um, getting some regional appointments done as, uh, as well as uh, getting an update from Tina on how that process is going. And then most immediately, of course, we have our Provincetown hearing in a couple of weeks. And um, that is looking really good in terms of organization, but we are also, I understand, having some trouble getting registrants. So we may want to get more commissioner uh, participation. I know, Sarah, you had mentioned at our special meeting where we were in person that you have a friend who is um, running a nonprofit in P-Town. And if we can, I would ask that, you know, maybe we put together an email on the staff side, um, maybe from at any of the wonderful staff. I don't even know who it might come from, Ellen or Tina or um, Shalaya about, you know, how we might muscle behind um, getting commissioner connections to rustle up some more staff or some more registrants. Um, so that's very exciting that we're going to get up to go out to B-Town, but we also want to make sure that we get a good crowd. So that's something on the front burner. Uh, also starting to plan our Pittsfield hearing for um, November. So um, very busy in program and planning. Very excited to get going with the committee next week. How many, how many registrants do you have? So when Ellen and I talked yesterday, or what, whatever day that was, time is meaningless, we only had a handful. So <laughs> Tina, we're up to 10. I, I think it's nine, oh, 15. Yeah. 15. Okay. Does so that's that much better. Because we've all registered. I assume we've all registered. Does that include us? There's only about three or four of you that are registered as far as commissioners. Okay. Thanks. So, so we have a dozen or so non-commissioners registered, which is much better than it was before, but we still want to get many, many, many more people registered. So um, I saw a post from Shy today on 
Facebook about how the hearing is going to be hybrid. We can all share that post. But if we could get like an updated push to commissioners out that, you know, even before the full commission meeting that says, you know, here, here's a link to the Facebook post that you can share. Here's an, an email that you can send to your network. Um, highlighting both, I think, that this is our return to in-person hearings. Ellen wrote a really great press release that was highlighting that. And then also, if you are not able to attend in person because you are not on the tip of the Cape, you can still come. Um, and that we're gonna have that opportunity for hybrid participation. So I think that would be my request to both the staff and the commissioners is one from the staff to get a, a renewed push um, like another email that reiterates the sort of toolkit that we have for getting it out, really being specific about what we can share, how, and then, you know, requesting of all the commissioners on this Zoom, as well as, you know, the other commissioners that we'll reach out to, to please um, share with your networks this exciting opportunity to participate in our hearing. So I um, Commissioner to... Bat, oh sorry, I, I'm driving, so I don't, I can't use the hand. I'll come after. Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, the, I would be happy to send something out myself to all of the commissioners. If someone could draft that for me, I would be happy to do that so that it's a charge draft of the commissioners for me. Thank you. In addition awesome. to whatever else we send. Um, uh, Commissioner Cox. So I just had some suggestions if you haven't done this already, Commissioner Beck. I'm just wondering if the staff has reached out to the state reps, the state senators, if there's a town council. We know that Provincetown um, is known for a big LGBTQ community. Have they like emails? And I tell my staff all the time, posts and emails aren't going to get it. This is a relationship business. Have we reached out to the caucus and some of our other partners asking them to share the information? Might it be for a state rep? So one just want to make sure all of that um, is being done, that the electeds, particularly when we go for our budget, know that we're there in that region. Um, so want to make sure that's being done. And then the second thing, because I'm always mindful and Commissioner back, you really should be thinking about this too. I think I heard Commissioner Fox. We're the veterans and we need to always be coaching and training new commissioners. Do people even understand? Because I think since Sarah's been here, certainly since Aisha's been here, they haven't seen a real hearing. The staff is new. Shaitia, I, I don't even know if Shaitia has either, but do people even understand what happens at our hearings, how those are conducted, does right down to the name cards, right? Does the staff know that we have place cards, how it's done, um, et cetera. So just wanna flag that to make sure that staff and new commissioners understand how our in-person hearings are done. Don't need to take the time to do that, but just wanna make sure yeah. that older commissioners are coaching, informing, educating um, the newer folks. I really appreciate that. And um, so you can't see that Shai and Tina and folks are shaking their heads yes for that we've reached out to our electeds um, and the the various folks on the, the hearing outreach list um, that, that work has been in process and going forward. And uh, we have attempted to make connections. Um, I know at least the state senator on the Cape is a member of the LGBTQ community and um, Julian Sear. And so we've been mindful to combine uh, touting that um, uh, theme that we're focusing on for our fall report, as well as reaching out to the electeds in general and specifically, as well as the our, our um, appointing authorities like the caucus. Um, and I really appreciate you're correct that um, it's been a long time since we've had a local hearing in person, and I will make sure to make time to work with uh, the staff to the extent that um, we, we need to go over things and make sure that everybody's up to speed and helping new commissioners to uh, really uh, smoothly transition into that. I'm going to see Tina's hand raised, if that's okay for me to call on her uh, chair. Yeah, please do. Uh, ben Smith. Yes, I just wanted to share a couple of things that I've been working on. So I individually have been talking to Cape 
and islands commissioners individually, one-on-one, -on -one, because I'm kind of familiar with all of their various networks. So I just wanted to let you know, uh, we've got our two Nantucket commissioners working on uh, folks showing up from Nantucket. They'll probably come in via Zoom. Um, I've got Amy Peters from the Wampanoag community working on, on folks there. So I just wanted to let you know that I'm having individual conversations and it, we're still 21 days out. Um, and I just, sadly, people kind of wait till maybe the week before to sign up. So I just wanted to just let you know what I'm working on. And then the organizations that I know, all the executive directors, I've, I've actually uh, been on the phone today um, just making sure everybody has it on their calendar. So just wanted to update you on things that I've been working on. Thank, thank you. Um, I will I will underscore again how much I appreciate all of those sentiments um, because I am very new. I'm also new to the state, which means I'm an openly lesbian um, leader. I am openly lesbian in the business community, in my life, in, in my private work, in my social justice work, all those things. You can leverage that. Let me make phone calls, but I, I need to know who to call. Um, so, so any of that guiding and coaching and, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to be, to be able to be leveraged. I just, I'm going to, I'm going to need that support. So I appreciate you, you calling that out because I, I really do. Um, and I, which is why I appreciate having, having, uh, commissioner Clark as an advisor. I just, I don't know who to call. And so th those kinds of things are really helpful. I also think that that underscores perhaps when we send out that introduction reminder to folks to register and to share the, you know, to sh share the word again, if I'm going to send that out, if there's a blurb about, and this is what you should expect, you should plan to dress business casual. You should plan to be on stage. You should plan to have um, name tags. You should plan to welcome. I'm going to assign each commissioner four people that I know are going to be there to make sure that that any of our representatives feel welcome. You know, those types of like sort of scripted um, dance would be really helpful. They would be helpful to me, um, and I want to be best prepared to represent the commission. And they'd be helpful for all for all of the commissioners. Um, and I know we, we are short on time. I do want to say this. I don't think an hour is enough. Um, with, with this meeting, if it's once a month and it's, we're orienting an entirely new staff and new executive committee, what do you folks think about making this until 530 on a regular basis going forward? That, I had it in my calendar until 530. So um, it's on the agenda till five, but yeah. I, I, there's no way we're, we can no. finish this. And it, I mean, I could be as efficient as possible, and unless I just dictate all the way through, which is not my style nor the, the culture of the commission, it's not going to work in an hour. So, is that is is there any objection to going until five thirty? I have to leave at five twenty to catch a train, but I have no objection in general. Okay, great, thank you, um, Ellen. Do you still have your hand up, or are you? Is that from before? Just to say that we are sort of can provide all of those things. So Shalaya has been coordinating outreach. We've been tracking the legislators and the partner orgs. And you know, if you want to review the list for anyone you know, and then we've also sort of been tackling a run of show almost down to the minute. So prep that we would need not only in advance, but also the day of, and then both tech and in-person needs. So we're sort of coordinating talking points for what's going to happen on the Zoom, those that are recording, and then um, expectations and talking points for those in person as well. So run of show, outreach plan, anything you need, we'd be happy to share. Yeah, that's awesome. I would just ask that, like, as you guys finish up work product, please loop me in um, so we can just keep things really transparent between commissioner and staff side. But that's awesome that that's all happening. Thank you. Um, I'm going to. I agree, and, and just quickly, I, 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 I'm trying not to be talkative, but Commissioner Back, you're exactly right because I listen to this and I say they don't understand how we do a hearing. That's that's not how. So I do think that Ellen or or someone program and planning, like just really quick, Sarah, our hearings are people come in, they send in written testimony, they do two testimony, the chair leads the hearing, and people are asked to get up and answer question. One commissioner may answer or or respond, but it's it's not it's it's not talking points it's a public hearing so these are all of the things that i worry about institutionally like is this all documented how we do a public hearing it's not an event with talking points it's for the public to come and share with us now during covid we had specific categories child care women of color but this is an opportunity for the women in provincetown in that region to come and testify for us to gather which Right, Rebecca, we know there's been problems on gathering the information on the back end for us to gather that data, part of our charge, write it all up and get it to 
the electeds and our appointing. That's what a hearing is. It's not what I just heard. No, Ms. Commissioner Clark, I definitely understand you. And I'm actually a former regional commissioner myself. I uh, have been involved for years. I, I definitely understand a public hearing and what we need. As far as talking points, maybe I misused the phrase, but I more meant like if we have folks, so we're, we're offering a hybrid option. So we're going to have to be mit mitigating both in person and remote. And so having sort of canned responses um, for those testifying online and making sure we acknowledge them or, you know, whenever their turn is to slot them in, just making sure that our language is prepared, that, you know, the chair feels prepped or whoever is speaking in that moment has what they need to respond. Um, so sorry if I used talking points incorrectly, maybe more making sure that the chair or commissioners feel prepped in their responses. Right. And and I'm happy to, Danella, I really appreciate you making sure that we, you know, return to how we do things. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to handle that. I know Sarah has a lot more to get through on the agenda. But program and planning will step in and make sure that the institutional knowledge is shared to the extent that the staff is not up to speed. Um, but I have full faith that we're in really good shape as um, just continuing to work on getting people registered. Thank you. And I, I will take all the advice and feedback I can get because I have never seen one. So I, I would I would very much appreciate that. Um, all right. So let's let's go through unless I have additional comments. I'd like to get through a couple of these other points. I believe that Nina said she could hop on. I want to see what she said. She said I should be able to come on after Rebecca. Yes. Nina, you want to go through your treasurer's report? Hi, thank you. I apologize, Madam Chair and Shai, um, for having to jump between these two meetings. But again, election week is bonkers, right? So hi, everyone. I'm super excited to um, talk about the, uh, the budget and the spending that we have. I just want to, again, preface this conversation. And I apologize also to the FineCom folks that every conversation I have will always come right with that lens of what are we doing this year? And what are we doing to prepare for the fact that fiscal year 24 will look drastically different, right? So whatever we talk about when it comes to the finances of the commission, I'll probably say it out loud, but if I don't just know that it is always with that lens of, okay, this is this year, it's a one-off, but we have to also look at fiscal year 24 moving forward as well. Um, so Marjorie, who is phenomenal, after we had the meeting the other day, uh, submitted the uh, budget with the supplemental budget to ANF yesterday. And she said within the week, we should be able to hear back. And so once she gets um, a response from them within the week, she'll of course let Madam Chair know. And then ideally from there, we can just let all the commissions know just so that we're all on the same page. Um, you know, I did ask her for a follow up, you know, within the week if we hadn't heard, but she's already on top of it for a checkup. So within the week, we should at least get an update, regardless of what happens. Um, and again, that is for the baseline budget of the 719 that we have this year, 719, 699 to be exact, but in addition to that as well, the supplement of 473. So once we get that approved, we'll be able to spend both the fiscal year 23 approved um, from the state as well as supplemental budget. Uh, we had also gone through and talked uh, about, again, items that we're going to be spending this year for that will not continue into fiscal year 24. And to summarize those items, the website in not including interpretation services. From that, we might pull a little bit of um, expenses into fiscal year 24 and forward for some maintenance things. But we're talking, you know, one to three thousand dollars. Right. So, again, that's not something we're going to look at until we're planning next year's budget. But. Um, again, just for this year only, it's the website, the 25th anniversary, uh, the marketing and branding, and this is what I had talked about the other day, where we can really establish, you know, our branding and our brand kits, not just for future commissioners uh, that will outlive us, but also for other, uh, you know, regional commission work as well, just to stay on branding and messaging for who we are, uh, the digitization process to move things into a digital space, and then, of course, a small amount of moving costs, um, you know, to move the in, into the new space. So, again, those figures will stay within fiscal year 23 to spend down the supplemental. Um, and then we are also making sure to look at what items we need to look at for fiscal year 24 moving forward. Um, one of the things that we had wanted to talk about, too, was that, and we don't have the amount yet, again, until it's finalized by ANF, but making sure that within the consulting line, we're being really intentional in our conversations about the DEI work we're doing, right? Bringing somebody on making sure that we have a contract in place and that is something we want to try to do this year. I do see that as something that I would like to extend in fiscal year 24 moving forward. Of course, we then have to get really creative and conservative with our spending in other areas. But from my takeaway, my conversations with multiple commissioners, it seems like that is a priority um, of the work we want to do here and, and something I certainly do, again, want to budget for. Um, some of the things that we're also keeping an eye on, of course, is staff, right? All around, we want to make sure that we're you know, taking care of our staff, but also our interns. And that's not just the interns for this commission, but also for regional as well. So we want to make sure that 
um, across the board. And this is a conversation we had just had earlier today, but has not been finalized. So I'll make sure to come back with a more detailed report and just how we're compensating regional interns uh, where you know we're considering that pay is different across the state. We certainly wanna make sure that we're being, um, you know, that we're living up to, to our norms and what we want. And so we're gonna have to rope Tina in for that conversation. And uh, again, it's very early preliminary conversations. I'll make sure to come back to all of you with a more thorough update. Um, what else, let's see, for policies. Okay, so uh, the other piece of the work that uh, we'll be bringing to you quite frequently in these meetings is again, A, keeping an eye toward fiscal year 24 and B, um, operations, right? That's a lot of my focus and my drive within um, you know, this sort of role as a treasurer is that I really wanna codify everything I possibly can under the sun as far as policies go, right? Like how are we offering grants? Um, how are we processing applications for grants? Uh, what are we doing as far as salary considerations? What are we doing for internship stipends? What are we doing for reimbursements for travel? What are we doing for reimbursements for childcare, et cetera, right? Like there's a lot of things that I think are um, subjective and I wanna make sure that they're objective moving forward. And so there are a couple of policies that we're working on. Uh, one that we had talked about earlier was sponsorships, right? And that's twofold. One is if we decide to sponsor, let's say Sarah says, okay, well, here's an organization, they want us to you know, donate X amount of dollars to be a sponsor. That's one side of sponsorships, right? The other is somebody wants to donate to the commission and be a sponsor. So it's two different pieces. Um, and we are hoping to, again, have something more concrete to bring to all of you. It's still in its infancy, but things like that, right? Like it, it, a lot of the work we're gonna do within this committee is going to be very heavily focused on creating systems, um, again, that will outlive us. And so those are the two priority items um, that really sits on top of every everything we do is fiscal year 24 planning um, and codifying policies. Uh, I spoke very quickly and very, <laughs> very sort of brief. Does anybody have any questions for me? So I don't, while folks ponder any questions, I don't have a question, just, just a couple of comments. So first, thank you for all the work you've done on this. The, the first pass of the budget as any treasurer, I can speak from experience last year is a huge lift, um, particularly when there is so much, um, when there were so many un unknowns and all these balls in the air um, in terms of what was gonna be approved and what wasn't. So excellent job. Thank you very much for your, for your incredible work. Um, and I think as, as yesterday was our practice run, lots of lessons learned, one on my end that, um, even though it was thought it was one thing and it was going to be really short, it, it we want to make sure that we give enough space to have longer conversations, but it, it gave us the chance to have a dry run on what that first presentation to the full commission is going to be because it, we, we voted on large categories in June. We've got new commissioners, we've got new staff, um, and you've now taken office where you weren't in before. Um, to We've got a chance to represent that budget using what we learned from how, how our discussion went the other day, which is make sure that we have the... Um, the trust fund in there, make sure that we on the front end talk to the big budget items. So those are like the narratives and, and the talking points that we get right out in front of it. So that we're answering questions before they're asked um, about how you own that presentation. And I think if you get in front of all of those things, people will ask, will will feel like they have to ask less questions because they'll be really informed. Um, so I think that's great. So I would I would do if if you could, I would do the full, the budget presentation with those narratives, make sure we have the trust and then um, a list of what policies you're talking about to, I think uh, I'm sensing a theme here, which I'm really excited about because that's also my, my feeling is I have one year um, we have, you know, we have, we have commissioners that constantly come. So what impact can we make that's going to outlive all of us? Cause we represent something so much bigger and so many people than here, than are here. So um, a theme throughout the year of creating systems that are sustainable is is a really exciting shift now that we especially have the, the staff to be able to do that which we didn't we didn't in the past which was which was our barrier um so that's that's great um yeah, no yes that was really informative as far as um the work i need to do on my end just to make sure that i do have like you said that narrative on the front end um but yeah i have about two pages of notes that was super helpful with feedback that i had gotten so i'm excited i think i think uh, the dry run was super 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 helpful i'm very glad we had the opportunity to do that I have no doubt you're gonna hit out of the park. Um, any other questions before we, we go on? Not, not a question, no. just a comment. I just wanna say, <laughs> Madam Treasurer, you are off to a great start. I Everything you're saying is music uh, to my ears and I have not selected a committee, uh, but if someone was to ask me, what am I most concerned about? It's the finances and everything that you just talked about, which is music to my ears. So I would love to, officially be on the finance committee. I haven't picked a committee um, yet, but 
just kudos to everything you're saying is music to my ear. So you're off to a great start. Welcome aboard, member. <laughs> um, no, I think I am still so new to this, and so I had to cut it to shy, Marjorie. Um, you know, it, it's and obviously, you know, Madam Chair, you've been great too. The more institutional knowledge that folks are willing to bring to this committee, whether you're just coming on um, to jump into a meeting and just listen in, right, and give me some feedback. Again, this is really helpful. I, I haven't been here long enough, I think, to have any history to go off of, and so I really do lean on all of you. Um, and your experience. So please, 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 again, jump into a meeting if you are available, uh, provide feedback, you know, wherever you can. And um, yeah, thank you all. I appreciate it. So I, I am also thrilled to hear that you would join the finance committee. I, I actually just assumed that you're trying to advise me as a brand new person um, was more than a full committee's worth of work. So the fact that you're going to do more than that is so, I am very grateful. Um, related to, let's see, um, yeah, let's uh, let's let's jump on to <clears throat> the diversity, equity, inclusion conversation that we had at our first meeting. Um, I, myself, Shaitia, and Aisha met yesterday with Gamel and Tanisha. So thank you both for jumping on, particularly because it's last minute. I know it's late in the day. Um, and I asked, I know all commissioners are invited to this meeting, but I asked in particular if they would be willing to join us for this conversation. Um, they lent us oh, more than an hour of time yesterday. Um, to talk about how we um, put into action what, what the entire executive committee agreed needs to be intentional and, um, and at, the, at the forefront of what we're doing in, in terms of center, center racial equity in our work and that that's visible to all. Um, and so we, we spent an, a little over an hour yesterday just brainstorming what could that look like and what, what shape does that take? Um, I had committed to put notes together, which I didn't have time to do until right before this meeting. So I'm going to share a link um, here that, that kind of captures the bullets of what we talked about yesterday. I'll go through them and then I would ask, um, and then I would, I would invite Tanisha, Aisha, or Gamel, and or, to, um, to add to that and then to take some direction in terms of where we go from here and make sure that we have agreement on what we discussed yesterday. So I'm going to go through these and I know I think I know Commissioner Clark, you're driving. I think Aisha, you might be trying to multitask. So I'll, I'll, I'll read through them as if you can't see them. Um, and if I'm being redundant, please feel free to, to interrupt. So one of the um, one of the things that came out of that discussion was crystallizing that diversity, equity, and inclusion work is not a committee, a flash in the pan, a one-time training, a um, pretty words. Um, it's not just content. I think Tanisha was the word, the word that you used, um, but it is actually, it, it's an embedding of, um, it's an embedding of, of that work and all that we do. And in order to do that, the recommendation was that rather than having a DEI committee, that the executive committee themselves takes on the charge of, of um, championing diversity, equity, and inclusion in what we do, and that we are essentially the, the equity inclusion committee. Um, so I, so before, before I go on, I want to make sure that I accurately describe that and that I don't have any comments. Accurately described, I just wanna say it out loud so that the people driving can hear, so. Thank yes. you. Um, so in, in that work that we, we broke down our discussion in, in two, two approaches to that work is that it's organizational change. And those are the things like the, the bylaws, the operational manuals, a strategic plan that needs to be updated this year. Um, a commitment to a written documented policy and commitments to supplier diversity, um, the operations manual, that those things in an institutional type setting are dismantling what is traditional and re rewriting that, that story in a way that is um, that's sustainable and lives on. So that's inclusive language in the, um, in the commissioner handbook. Um, that's what our onboarding looks like. That's um, what audiences we have to meet or we have to be able to, to document that we've included in order to say that we've been inclusive and that we've had everybody at the table when we do those, when we, do, when we release policies and data, et cetera. And um, that that is embedded from the operations of how we work organizationally in um, our legislative priorities, what frame we use to prioritize those and in our program, programming outreach and data. So I will pause there just from a, um, the bucket of organizational change. That, so that's, that's, is that resonating with everybody? Yes, okay. Um, I, the, the second um, 
would be so that that's a commitment in the in the policies, procedures, and the way that we work and we show up and do that work, um, and who's represented in that work um, is is in everything that we do. And if that is vocal, reminded, and led by the executive committee, reminded by the executive committee, and constantly visible, then um, that alone I think is going to shift the work that we do. And it gives permission to call in, call out to check ourselves, to make sure that we ask who's here and who's not and who's represented and who isn't. The second piece of that may, um, is a little bit more, I don't use the word challenging. It's a, it's a, little, it's a little bit more um, frenetic in that we have commissioners that come in and out just, just by nature of the, the way that we're appointed. And so there's one thing to, to document things in our bylaws and such that that live that outlive us. It's another thing to have a sustainable way that we can make sure that's a priority in how we represent amongst each other, to each other, and in our public facing interactions. Um, and that's that's the second part of that, which is the cultural change. And cultural change is both what we commit to as a group and then who we are internally um, and how we show up. Um, and in that, there are there's onboarding and training, there are retreats. There's group norms that we can agree to. There's those types of things. Um, I am less clear on the, the most effective and impactful way to start that work. Um, and so I think there's many more discussions that need to be had, but those were kind of the two buckets that are our first initial introduction to how we do this work yesterday divided that, um, that commitment. And I'm going to ask for some help from um, anyone that was in the meeting yesterday that could expand on that cultural piece. If you don't know, mind, I can just add a little bit more to that. So the the difficulty with the culture change part is is um, again it's bound in the nature of how we operate. We don't all show up to the same workplace every day, right? And are interacting with each other, you know, uh, eight hours a day, Monday through Friday, and have all these opportunities to kind of um, build relationship and trust and connection and all these other kind of things, right? We show up to a meeting and have to say a bunch of things and get a bunch of things done. And then, you know what I mean? Then kind of move on and accomplish a bunch of other things. And then we have like, you know, 17 other jobs, right? So there's, um, it, there's, there's a structural thing that makes it difficult to do that kind of work. And then the second part of it is, is that there's a part that really requires skill building, right? And that's a longer process and those kinds of things. And so, it's not to say that it is there isn't a value in engaging in that effort. It's just uh, harder, right? Um, and uh, would take like a, a longer amount of time, uh, more uh, energy and commitment from uh, everybody in the commission, which is why the dual track thing is a great way to approach it because so much of, of um, what the commission does is kind of, um, creating, maintaining, and sustaining the institutions that we have now, right? So we were just all talking about institutional memory for all the different other aspects of everything, right? So it's about creating new institutions, stopping some institutions, right? Uh, changing current institutions. So those are things that can kind of, uh, you know, have like little bursts of energy into them, right? Um, and then live on beyond people. When you're talking about kind of the culture change stuff, that's like, atmosphere, terroir, it's like, it's just very, it's like vibe, right? So it's hard to kind of grab and get your hands around in any way, shape or form. It's more like about um, setting a vision, setting group norms, setting, you know, shared vocabulary, and then always doing them, right? And following through on them. And that there's, that's a process. And so that would require a lot of um, you know engagement. I, I I see other hands, but I just want to make sure it, it, to I'll let Tanisha add more if you wanted to. I think that's good. Um, I almost feel like actually I don't almost feel like uh, I've said in the space like I don't do DEI work. DEI is content. Um, dialogues across differences is process is like you can know all the things establish all your norms but what happens when somebody doesn't uh, follow that norm and that's something that's bound to happen especially in this particular institution where things are already hot and people aren't able to connect across these differences like it boils it boils over and then the conversation's done and gets swept under the rug and it's like okay we try again at the next meeting and it just continues to to blow up in the ways that, that it has um 
uh, teaching dialogue, it's a skill set, right? And it's one that folks need and it's applicable across all areas of your life, whether you're talking about at home or on the commission. And it gives people, I guess, that baseline skill set to be able to stay in these difficult dialogues and the ways that you would need to tap out. Right, you're gonna get on your self-regard horse and ride out like, nope, not doing this today. And you're evaluating like, is this a dialogue of respect? Is this a relationship worth keeping? You know, those kinds of things. And it's it's teaching folks how to be able to do that. Right. It's like you can know all your DEI words and terminology and all that stuff, but that that's great. What are we doing with it when it falls apart? Which it more than likely would fall apart because we're dealing with things that are hot. It's none of the content is neutral. You know, if you have, you know, folks that are showing up on the commission who feel like it should be all women, but then all women, just like all lives matter, like in that context, there's there's big stuff, right? So it's gonna continue to be this way until folks have a skill set. Like, how do we navigate this to be able to shift culture like gradually, like keep it going? And again, having ongoing um, conversations and training space. And I mean, even as commissioners come in and out, you know, it's like whoever was here, you know, and got whatever training, it remains and they can pass that along. And um, I, I knew the commission needed a dialogue <laughs> across differences training, like <laughs> when I first logged on. And here we are. So. Yeah, I think and they, and they, I see the hands. I, I think that we look at our work as as representing women in the, in the Commonwealth externally. This is an opportunity in this in this venue to also be the change ourselves, so that when commissioners go off, that that impact is last not only internally but also lasts with them. That they're able to impact women from throughout the, the rest of their lives, right? Is that, that that impact is changing and that each woman that leaves the commission when their term is up continues to make that impact. That is doing the work like at the ground level. Um, so I'm I'm really excited about doing that as hard as it, as it is, will and should be because it's, it's personal and it's hard. Um, Commissioner Clark. So this question is for you, Madam Chair, Tanisha and Gamel as somebody that tried to do this work, as Nina Kimball tried to do this work, I've come to the mind that you cannot legislate heart, H-E-A-R-T. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the conversation that you and I had this morning where you shared that a fellow white commissioner thought because you were the new white chair that she was going to tell you that we're moving in the wrong um, direction in terms of everything that was just said. And so what I struggle with as a commissioner of color is, and I always have struggled with this, to Tanisha's point, you have people coming in and out. You cannot legislate hard. Yes, we're here for all women in the Commonwealth, but how do you go off and change, particularly like somebody that you met with recently to change that mindset? And do we run the risk of moving in a direction with people coming and going and you can't legislate hard by going down um, this path? Because, you know, like that commissioner you met with, that person's not going to change. And then do you set up factions within, um, within the commission? And, and you thought there was a move afoot with that. So I that's my question is, is how do you do this in a structure in the way we're made up? You know, Shaitia could probably go off and do training with her staff, hoping they're not going to leave. We've all gone through these dialogues and trainings. I, I just don't know how that works when you can't legislate someone's heart. If someone fervently believes that um, it's all women, not just women of color, I I, I would just be curious as to you guys who've gone into organizations, how you change that in a commission that's structured the way we are. So, so I, that you I, don't I, have this spill over to our electeds where people, as you said, Sarah, are going out to the appointing authorities saying, oh, they're changing the commission. They're not living out their mandate or their mission. I, I appreciate that. And you just underscored why this why this work is, is hard. 
Um, that that as as in my role as chair and in myself as as a human, just Sarah, um, that doesn't dissuade me from saying it's it's still the necessary work that we need to do. Um, we talked yesterday about when you when we're focusing that work on those furthest from the resources, we're uh, we are including everyone. If you start anywhere else, you automatically aren't, and we are just by nature of that not living our um, not living up to our charge. So the reverse is true rather than, than, than how that's been phrased. You can't, you can't change because the work, particularly the cultural work is internal. You, I agree, you can't change hearts if hearts don't wanna be changed. What you can do though, is commit to inclusive language. You can make the ecosystem um, with a majority. And we, one of the, the structures that is, that, that is a, a white supremacist culture, which is that, that voting Robert's rules of order that where that works in our favor in this particular moment, is that then it gives voting power to be able to say the majority is going to change, um, you know, do we do how we use a racial equity framework and um, assessment before we put something out? Um, the the bylaws and things like that, like those things, they, you don't have to change hearts because because if you have the vote, you can change the institution, and hopefully hearts follow. And if they don't, you're still. Um, we're still living up to our values, which are to, to reach every woman in the Commonwealth. And there is no other way to do it if you don't do this work. Um, so I would say that that would be, I think, my, my short response. Um, mm -hmm. Because it isn't about one commissioner or, or even maybe a group of commissioners. It's not about me or even this group here. It's bigger than us. And so that's why we have that system so that one person doesn't get to then control the narrative. Um, and then I know I know you opened that question to everyone that was in the discussion yesterday, so I will pause there and let those respond. I was going to say what you were going to say. So, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> Y'all handle the institutional stuff that you're trying to mm -hmm. swim in and get out of at the same time. Um, right. Janelle, I appreciate you. Um, you, I appreciate you. Uh, and I will say that. The training work that I do, to your point, we work to get people out of their heads and into their hearts because, to, as you say, these are heart issues. It is very personal. It is um, political. None of the things are neutral. We know neutrality never helps those who are being oppressed. It always helps the oppressor. There's also the point that I want to make. We don't go in trying to change anybody's mind because you can't change somebody's mind. If you think about any time somebody's tried to change your mind, nine times out of 10, you have dug in your heels and tripled down on your position. My job is to not change your mind. It's to help you see the things that you don't. And for the commissioners that are struggling in this position of all women and blah, 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 they don't see themselves and they don't see the missing pieces, right? When, uh, Sarah talks about when we can help those who are the furthest away from the resources and the most impacted, then everybody else can have access. That's the part that's missing. Or it's the fear of like, oh, well, if those people have the focus on them, then I won't have what I need, which we know that that's not how it works. There's also the setup in the training where white folks need to hear about white people stuff from white people. And I worked with someone, we were talking about the, uh, I guess we would call them our trusted white people, allies. I'm like, listen, go and get your people. And to me, that means it's the side conversations that need to happen where there's someone who can say, this is the behavior that we've been socialized to do. This is what it looks like when we do it. This is the impact of people that we work with, care about, love, all of those things. And that might be an ongoing conversation. Some people, the light bulb goes on at the first conversation because it's like, oh, I had no idea that that's how I've been behaving or that that's how I'm being received. So it's not about changing anybody's mind. It's can you see yourself? Can you see the impact that you're having with your words and your actions? And as a black woman, I can't give that to a white woman. I mean, I can say, listen, you are running me into the ground. You're making me uncomfortable. You're doing all the things. And then I'll be accused of being the angry black lady or when did this get belligerent? And it's like, it didn't get belligerent. You're just not used to having your position challenged or questioned or me inserting some new information for you to think about. And I've made you uncomfortable. And because you're uncomfortable, white lady trick, oh, when did this become belligerent? 
it's having another white woman be able to say, this is exactly how we behave. It's like clockwork. The only reason I know it is because I work with a white lady who is divulging all the white lady tricks. And it's like, oh, that's what needs to happen. And that's what makes dialogue training different. It's not DEI. Nothing that I've said to you is about DEI. We talk about uh, social change theory, which all of that came out after World War II. Why? Because how do you get people to do these atrocious things? There is science behind that. Why human beings behave how they do. What makes people actually come to change? Right? Is that lifelong process? Yes, but you can start at a baseline and then that will continue to grow. Right? Like we come to this work and we show up in these kind of ways and we're committed to growth, however painful it uh, winds up being. Right? Like to my not like we're here, so nobody tapped out. I'm like, I just did this yesterday. And I'm just like, oh, is it exhausting? Yes. Is it something that needs to happen? Yes. And my job, it's not to sell you on it. I know that it works. It's worked on college campuses, worked in state systems. Like we did a seven week uh, intensive with the Department of Public Health. It was the Undoing White Supremacy series. And that's, we went through it all because we do Undoing White Supremacy dialogues across differences, compassionate, accountable conversations, holding affinity groups, community mobilization. Like this stuff actually works. We work with the New York Dispute Resolution folks and they're mediators and they're supposed to be neutral and we're telling them none of this is neutral and people are being changed they're changing institutions fighting with board people shifting staying in that tension so that's how this does shift not like is this person gonna get it and blah 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 eventually yeah or they it's the messenger like like i said Danelle, i appreciate you because i know you were in it and you were trying to say all of the things right i saw the experiences but we can't report it we can't we can't reflect back to those folks what they need to see because we're not them and that's how it get get out of your head and get into your heart right like that connectivity thing like there's an underlying value like if you if you look for what problem is this person trying to solve with the things that they're saying and i gave the basic example yesterday about i don't see color that's great. You have simplistically in your mind solved the problem of racism. I don't see color. I treat everybody the same. That's nice. However, it doesn't work that way. And being able to insert what is missing in that person's simple solution. When you don't see color, you essentially don't see me. You erase my experience and my identity. And then it becomes, how do we hold space for these two things? Because I'm not going to invalidate what this person has said. I'm not going to uphold their abusive values and nonsense. How can we honor the fact that you want to treat everybody the same with respect and know that there are people who are treated differently because of the color of their skin? And when we don't acknowledge that, we're doing a disservice. Powerful facilitative question, A plus B. And effective world leaders use it. If you think about Mario Cuomo during the pandemic, well, we still, we still, but anyway, the things that he was saying on TV, how can we do this and this? And people were riveted, like he should run for president until other things. But this is, there's a science behind it in psychology. So that's how this can shift and become new institutional policy, the way we do things, the way we connect with each other, because it's always about that bridge across the differences. And all the women in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the only thing again I, I, I'd add is is it's it it needs to then be paired with all the institutional change for the structures of the way the commission functions, and that's the way in which there's a vision set of. And to be honest, I really like if we all just did the, you know, if we focus on the people furthest from the resources, it lifts all boats. That's the vision statement, right, of how we approach the equity lens on the things that we do with the commission. It's as simple as that. If that's the vision statement of what we um, orient all the work into doing, and it's a consistent message, and it's embedded in all the different institutions that we do, it will slowly happen. It might not happen as fast as some people want it to happen, but it's definitely. But it's not going to not. It's not going to stop. It's not going to be as slow as other people want it to go because they don't want change, right? And so there's always this push and pull on the both sides of those kinds of things. And if there's a consistency 
um, in maintaining with that messaging and connecting it with the institutional change while you're doing the culture change work, over time, the culture changes and becomes a new thing. And then it becomes embedded, it becomes sustainable. And one of the, the last the last thing I'll add, and then um, Mr. Clark, I wanna make sure that you have an opportunity to, to respond to, every, to everything that you just heard. Um, the reason that Doc, Dr. Miller and I reached out directly to Tanisha and Gamal um, with Shaitia was to say, we happen to have this unique moment in time where we have more women of color on the board than, or I'm sorry, on the commission than we've ever had. And we have two commissioners on the board that do this for a living, three actually, Dr. Miller also, also does this work as part of her current role, that does this for, for a living all day, every day, in addition to the lived experiences of, of, of living, living the life as, as a woman of color. And so if we can't start this work in a sustainable way, when we have these kinds of resources right here at our table now, when will we ever do it? And so that was the conversation of how do we use who we have at the table today to move it forward. It's not, we're not gonna you know, change the entire world in one year, but we can certainly move forward. And if we can't do it now, then when? And um, so I, I am tremendously grateful that you were both willing to take that time um, and to continue to engage to, to do the work. Um, and I just think that we have a unique opportunity that we didn't have available in the past. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and make sure Commissioner Clark that you have an opportunity to, to respond. Oh, and she said I'm all set. Okay, um, so all set, but also knowing that this is a this is an ongoing dialogue and this is continued work and this is going to be all day, all the time. Um, so I, I know this is going to be more conversations. Is there anyone else that wants to add? I know um, Christine, you had your hand up, so I'll I'll turn that over to you. And then if anybody else wants to to add or interject, I think I shot a, a note to Dr. Miller. I know she's she's multitasking right now, but I just want to make sure that I give enough time for the other people to to speak up if they want to. Sure, thanks, uh, Chair Glenn Smith. My original comment um, was about, I think that this should definitely apply to not just commissioners, but commissioners and staff and potential, mm -hmm. potentially interns as well. This vision for the organizational, operational and cultural change, which I think is excellent. And I'm so appreciative and thankful for this very important conversation today. And one other thing that I heard, I think it was Commissioner Arena say, was that one intervention could also be white folks talking to white folks about how to be a better ally or calling in or calling out and having that be one avenue for change. Um, that was something that I heard and it's just so unfortunate to hear that there's a commissioner or commissioners who refuse to change their heart or shift their ideology, even when being called in or called out by other commissioners who have uh, different lived experiences. And maybe that's one thing um, white identifying commissioners can commit to through our journey, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and to really live uh, all of our values. And that's something that I can uh, certainly commit to and really would love to have more conversations about it. That's something that I do in my organization as well. I co-chair our equity team and do some work of white identifying folks talking to white identifying folks about being better allies. Um, so we'll definitely be thinking about that more. And again, really thankful for this really important conversation. And I and I want to be, I want to be to be really direct in that this isn't about one commissioner or any commissioners that I don't propose to know what's in anybody's heart. Um, and and when we talk about what do we do when people don't adhere to those values, um, I think we have a set of expected norms that will. That, that we'll implement. And then that doesn't leave, that leaves less room for that kind of thing. But I, I wanna be very intentional about not making this about any one commissioner or any one commissioner that will or won't change because it's it's bigger than, than us. It's bigger than that one person or two people. Um, and using this system to our, to our advantage, the, sh the culture will shift and they can, can get on board or not is when we're reaching the most women possible, we've met our charge. And so it almost doesn't matter because it's bigger than that. And so I, 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 whenever, or if that comes up where it's one commissioner to another commissioner about that individual, I'd like to steer it towards what is our collective work and what are our collective values and not go, I don't want to be derailed by anyone's, you know, one, one person being uncomfortable with, with um, being inclusive because it is just the right thing to do. Um, 
I saw a comment, so I just want to make sure that I'm seeing all the, it's always hard when it's remote. Thank you. You have to switch to a phone. Thanks, Merida. Um, any other comments before I go to just kind of the last part of this document? Okay. Um, the work of the work is always, okay, we can commit to handbook changes, bylaw changes, inclusive language, training, et cetera, et cetera. It's where do you start? When do you start? How do you measure it? How are you transparent for um, Madam Treasurer? How do we make sure that the lines in our budget that are public facing identify that that's a commitment? You know, where how, how are we visible in that intentional work all the time in everywhere that someone could look? Um, and, and that's a whole body of work in of itself. It's in, it's in and centered in everything that we do, but it's also, we could talk about training, um, but what dollars are we going to commit to it? Who are we giving our dollars to? How do we actually start the, um, the programs and program and planning can start the, um, the work of, of changing language and things like that and, and bylaws to bring that to the commission, but how do we start the, the cultural piece of it? Um, what training should we talk about? How many dollars do we want to talk about? How do we engage and who do we engage with? I think that requires one more conversation, but I think that's going to be the charge when you, when we bring this conversation to the whole commission is what are we doing that's more than just talking? So we're not saying training is a good idea. Um, dialogues are a good idea. Um, white women talking to other white women is a good idea. Now, how do we put that into action? I, I, where I've seen this work not move as fast as I would like it to in my organization, sort of a couple of years of lessons learned the hard way of what, how not to do it. Is, is there's been a lot of lessons learned about how to do it too. And one of the ways that, that from my experience here, I will say is not to do it, is to come to a, a group of people with a plan that doesn't have anything behind it. And so I'd like to spend some time putting, so what does that look like in action? Um, and both, um, both uh, Gamal and Tanisha and Aisha have talked about being willing to have another conversation to, to bullet out what that actually looks like in practice. Um, and so I, I'm appreciative of that work. And I think there does need to be another conversation about how we bring a real plan to the, to the commission for a reaction to. Um, but I'm open to any other feedback, suggestions, or comments on how we would do that so that we're not going into a room um, like we talked to Ellen about earlier. I don't like to go into a room and not anticipate what questions are going to be asked or, um, and so I want to make sure that we're setting that up to succeed. Um, and how do we frame that and how do we introduce that I, I know I don't know. I know I know what I don't I not even sure I don't know what I don't know or however you say that I need some help in that way, and so I would appreciate the feedback. <laughs> Other comments. Thank you Commissioner Arena she's got jump off. Any other comments, questions before I wrap up? Okay. Um, Shaitia, did we miss anything on the agenda? We are out of time, so I want to make sure there wasn't anything critical that we needed to do before I start to wrap up. We didn't get to um, the report for the legislative um, committee or the organizational structure, which is another item down on the bottom, but um, I see we lost Meredith, and I don't know if Commissioner DiCarvalho, you want to give a quick I, mean, I will give a the most succinct version of, of an update. Basically, we went over the policies and the updates on what happened to them, right? The legislative priorities. And then there was a, a new item presented regarding the SANE, which is the Sexual Assault Nurses Exam, uh, is what that stands for. And uh, the concerns regarding a decision made at some level in the DPH to make those be remote, um, uh, like telehealth sessions, rather than funding the in-person work of uh, that in the Cape and the Islands area. And uh, how, you know, that's not best practice. And there's a lot of uh, bad implications of that kind of thing and will could have domino effects down the line for um, access and all kinds of things as well as chain of evidence type of things and you know all kinds of concerns were brought up which were good ideas and all those things uh, the takeaway was to uh, research a bit more to kind of get a comprehensive understanding of the impacts and meeting with the DPH person to you know be like hey what happened and then uh, you know put some pressure to have them change your mind. Does that capture basically what happened? <laughs> okay. So well, Mary, where does we have you? So <laughs> kind of captured <laughs> I captured it on the same on the same um, stuff, yes. <laughs> 
Thank you, D. Carvalho. I was listening and I said, is she gonna, she's got it, she's got it. <laughs> All right, try it. <laughs> but, but we, um, the Legislative and Public Policy Committee, we're gonna work on that same. We're, we're gonna set up a meeting for next week. Um, we're um, involved in trying to um, pull some of the coalitions back together to see what we need to do. And we're gonna also reach out to see if we can set up meetings with our two um, candidates for governor to have a pre -com So she's frozen a little she bit. She froze. I'll yeah. just fill in. So the trying to uh, either uh, send questions to the governor candidates for the different two different parties or connect Love with a, something that's already happening. Yeah. So we are going to reach out to have a conversation with him because he does he has a history, you know. So we need to know um, where he's going to stand once he gets into the um, gets onto the ballot for November. Where where things are going to go, but we're we're um, you know, and we're going to be working on again the coalitions and trying to see what we can bring to the table for the new um, term in January, be it endorsements or bringing some language from things that we've learned. Um, through our hearings and our reports to um, see if we can go ahead and move forward as um, creators of legislative language instead of just endorsers or sponsors. And I, that brings you basically to where we are right now um, with legislative and public policy after our first meeting yesterday. Great. Oh, but I just want to add, there was a lot of conversation about, you know, uh, funding for IUDs and also the implications of Roe and perhaps kind of combining that into one yeah. effort. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Right. That was yeah. based on the Colorado study that I had shared with Jai. Yeah. So yes. they did a study that's based on a European model where they provided IUDs, which don't require a lot of follow up and long term care, and they last a long time. And in Colorado, teen pregnancy rates dropped precipitously. Um, it had all kinds of benefits, including a huge financial benefit, but it's something the United States hasn't embraced because we're not a national health system um, for among other reasons. We, we like the profits over here, but um, that we talked about that. And then the feminine, the, the condoms and talking about putting all condoms, that together. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And possibly pulling it together as an omnibus bill or That's omnibus right. bit line item pulling it all in, Planned Parenthood, um, IUD, yep. you know, teen teen sexual awareness, and also reaching out, I did, thank you for that, um, Di Carvalho and Jean, and also reaching out possibly to Rep O'Day so we can have more conversation. Yes. We can help them with the Healthy Youth Bill, maybe um, updating the language and doing a little bit more about getting that forth. And maybe that could be something we could do as an omnibus bill. That, that sounds like a um, really powerful one meeting. You did that in one meeting yesterday. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Um, so I think I, I am looking forward to seeing the draft agenda for the full commission meeting. I would like um, Shaitia to make sure that, that goes out to the exec, well, me first, and then the executive committee um, as a draft before it goes public, because I think we've got a lot of exciting updates to give and opportunities for feedback to how, how we are gonna engage on doing this work. Um, with that, I know we are eight minutes past time. Um, our new time is till 5.30, not five. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that, start, that started today. So we're eight minutes past time. So if, if anybody has any last minute um, additions, comments, questions, I will open really quickly. And then if not, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I'll second. Who is that? Okay. Talk who did the first Aisha. motion? Aisha. Yeah, Dr. Right. Miller motion. Oh, second. Perfect. Um, do we have to do we have to do a roll call to vote on that? Do you have to vote to adjourn? I don't think so. Perfect. Meeting adjourned. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. I'm sure I will talk to you before next week. Thanks so much. All right. Bye bye.